100 billion. Um, and, and Sweden and Mexico and Asia, the collapse of long-term management. This was a, a financial, a small financial crisis. The dot-com crisis, of course, a crash in 2001, and here we are in 2007 through, through who knows when. Okay, let me just summarize what I've uh, said to what I've said up, up to now. Okay, so maybe I just should have done this and not shown you all that and confuse you. <laughs> in essence, that in, in modern uh, capitalism, that is uh, monopoly financial capitalism, financialized monopoly capitalism, you have a tendency to stagnation. And if you don't have some sort of technological uh, uh, innovations that propels a self-sustaining growth, uh, through the whole economy, then you continue to have stagnation. And by the way, we can talk about the computers and, and the whole electronics industry. It has not had the same effect on the economy. It's changed the way we live, it's changed the way many of us work, but it has not had that kind of a stimulation effect on the economy at all for, for a number of reasons. So you have slow growth of the real economy and a few prospects for, for profitable investments. This leads to them a huge increase in debt in all economic sectors relative to the economy, a huge increase in speculation, an increase in leverage buyouts that weaken companies in the real economy that I mentioned. This is all part of the financialization process. Increased political influence of the financial sector, getting deregulation and lower taxes. The financial sector basically controls much of what happens in the U.S. government with regard to the economy. Uh, numerous frauds, some of them are legal frauds, some of them are not legal. Uh, bubbles that keep propelling the economy. During the bubbles, people feel more wealthy. They, they even just, my house is worth $50,000 more this year than it was last year. Even if I don't go and get a second mortgage and use that money, many people did that. That's one of the ways they were able to keep the standard of living going up. But even if you don't do that, you tend to spend more money. You say, well, I don't need to save as much because my house is worth more money. Um, and so these bubbles propel the economy, partially because of the, of the wealth effect, people thinking that they're wealthier. And then what it happens is you have a delayed day of reckoning, and then you have a very fragile system. And the fragile system has, uh, is broken at this point. So um, who pays? Okay, who pays for the crisis? Well, this you can summarize very quickly. Everything that's done by the governments of Europe and the United States, and I think Japan as well, have been to preserve capital, have preserved the wealth of the wealthy, to make sure the banking interests are preserved and make sure that the wealthy don't lose money. <coughs> that has been their primary goal, and the way they say it is, we have to save the financial system. Well, there are different ways to do it. The government of Ireland did not have to assume the debt of, of the banks. Mm -hmm. they didn't, and in the United States, they didn't have to either. Here, here. It didn't, they, 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 are, they are paying, all the bondholders are getting 100 cents on the dollar, 100%. All the people who own the stock have made out quite well. So the, the people who actually invested didn't lose anything. There's a, a fellow who is a former student at the University of Vermont who has a program on the local television, and it's called Socialism for the Rich. And that's what the program's about, basically. It's not socialism, but it's basically, you know, socialize the losses, and the, the, the profits, of course, are privatized. And so, uh, so that has been the major impetus. You think, my God, with all these housing, with the housing crisis, there would, would have been more done. There was a little bit done to help people who were in trouble of, of, and they were losing their homes. But no, that wasn't where the emphasis was put. The emphasis was put on preserving capital preserving the capital system, preserving the financial system in a certain way, again. So what they could have done is you could nationalize a bank, the Swedes did this, nationalize a bank, too bad for the bondholders, too bad for the stockholders, they may get something. And you, anyone who had, you know, uh, if you had uh, deposited your money in your bank, you'd be fully covered. And then you can reprivatize it, even in a capitalist system. There, is, there are other ways to deal with it than to actually pay them everything. When the, when the U.S. government gave all this money to AIG, AIG, you know, do you know about this? Okay. Mm -hmm. 
what did they do? Most of that money was money that was owed to American banks. I mean, that's the reason, that, you know, was, uh, to, to Goldman Sachs, to you know, investment people. So the, the money just went back. Again, why did it have to be 100 cents on the dollar? Okay. The first time you hear a discussion now in the advanced capitalist countries, within the last week or two, that the Germans are saying, well, maybe the holders of the private holders of Greek bonds maybe should take a haircut. That's the that's the uh, jargon or financial jargon, which means that maybe they shouldn't get 100 percent back. Uh, maybe they should take a 10 percent or 20 percent haircut. Um, but that's the first you hear of that, of that discussion. So uh, so who has lost? Obviously, are the workers or the people on salary, uh, the, the unemployed. And the people who are employed who are making very low wages because of the, the cutting, the austerity measures that are cutting down, the, 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 uh, what benefits there were in the United States are very stingy to start with in general. And so these are the people that are really suffering. And, uh, and they are the ones uh, who are going to continue to suffer uh, because capital, unless they are able to get organized in some fashion, uh, to, uh, to uh, fight for, for their rights. What happened in the United States with the development of the social programs of the United States that came out of the 1930s, it only happened because of organized labor. And it only happened because of the fights that, that occurred. And uh, also in Europe, social democracy came out of a very strong labor movement and communist and socialist movement. And, and what you have now are very weak, a very weak left, a very weak labor movement, and that's, that is not a recipe for solving these issues in a progressive manner. Um, so uh, this does not leave uh, us with a, uh, with I would say a very hopeful uh, scenario. And I don't, I don't see anything on the horizon that, that is obvious that is going to, to sort of bring back a vibrant economy to the United States or, or to Ireland. Uh, but, uh, but I hope that the talk has given you some perspective as to, as to first off, how severe it is. I guess you, you know that uh, here, that it's very severe. And, uh, and uh, also, you know, why it happened and why this is different from the other ones. And even throwing more and more money at it is not going to really solve it at this point. Uh, you've got to get rid of all that debt. And that's what happened in the Depression. People went bankrupt. Businesses went bankrupt. You got rid of debt. If we could wipe out all this debt, of course, the banks would never agree to it. We could start the whole thing all over again. <laughs> and I could go get another mortgage. I could get seven credit cards. I could do all sorts of things, and I could begin the whole process again. But, but uh, in the absence of something else that's going to stimulate it, debt has been the crutch, really, that has, that has kept the economies of... Uh, of the advanced countries going, mm -hmm. uh, if even not that way. I better end there, or else I'll get myself into trouble.